just you get to choose. Right? Like here's here's the scenario: the, the environment gives us something which can be perceived as negative, can be perceived as not working, can be perceived as problematic. The world's ending. So we get to choose to see it like that, or we get to see choose to see it as an opportunity. So clearly, that it's my responsibility now to do that for other people. If I have information, and you know, other people's success is my success, and vice versa. Because you know what, like the challenges or the roadblocks are the journey themselves. There's no big things. It's all little things compounding on top of each other. Right. Mike Skripnek understands that healing our past traumas and reforming our subconscious patterns allows us to realize our unlimited worth. He will show you ways to gain insight needed to develop the awareness to overcome limits, keeping you from your own personal or professional happiness and success. Mike is an international bestseller of nine books, a keynote speaker, podcast host, men's mental health advocate, and sought after business strategist who has shared his insights and wisdom with thousands of passionate, purpose-driven entrepreneurs, business leaders, and executives. His recently released book, Unlimited Worth, Lessons of Healing from Childhood Trauma, Finding Happiness, Love, and Its Success for Male Leaders, is available on Amazon. Mike lives, loves, and adventures with his wife, Sherry, and their two young adult children, Madison and Cohen, in the beautiful Sea to Sky Corridor of British Columbia, Canada. You can find them skiing, snowboarding, hiking, mountain biking, paddleboarding, and more in the mountains and on the rivers and oceans just minutes from home and one of, one of the most beautiful places on earth. Mike, welcome to True Seekers. <laughs> Thanks, Josh. I appreciate it. Sorry to give you such a big mouthful there. <laughs> no worries. It makes me want to go out to BC and, and partake in some of these events with you. And well, you got it. If you haven't been here. You know, we like to say it's uh, it don't come, but uh, we want everybody to be here. It's a, it's a special place. Love it. Well, what I'm excited to explore today is that, you know, we, we have guests on our podcast of all different walks of life and in different parts of their journey and progress. Uh, just the fact that you've written nine books <laughs> it tells me that you're at a place of productivity in your life and you have so much to share today. So I'm just excited to see where we start and where we end up. Uh, me too. Yeah, it's funny. Five. Uh, I was on book number five at the beginning of the pandemic, and so threw in four, four more in that interim. <laughs> wow! A few, a couple co-authored, couple of ebooks, um, and then this recent book. Took advantage of the, of the time, and I'm wondering: are you are you born in British Columbia, or ha has something drawn you out to that space there? I'm born and raised in Calgary, Alberta, Canada. Uh, so I always say Denver without the guns, you know, uh, about the same million plus million, million, two people, fantastic place and, and a province and a city built on oil and gas and beef, beef and farming. Um, so um, definitely a wonderful place in itself. Mm. Well, I'd like to uh, jump into a little bit more about what your book is about in association with um, you know, something that is one of my favorite topics, because I think it's becoming more welcomed in the, in the business environment, maybe 10 years ago, even five, you know, to talk about men's trauma, I don't think was, it was very taboo and still might be today, but I think it's people like you who are making it more normalized to talk through this because, because why, why is this important that we talk about? Uh, well, first and foremost, it's killing men at a rate that uh, eclipses women. So we're dying earlier. We're getting ill we're um, losing ground in so many ways. And I know there's not a lot of people, you know, playing the, they're playing the world's smallest violin right now for us. Um, and it's not about whether or not um, it's a woe is me. It's just a fact. And the fact is that men are experiencing depression at higher rates than ever before. Um, four out of five suicides that are committed by people between 30 and 60 are men. Um, anxiety, depression, you know, the other top reasons why we die in particular men die earlier than women, um, heart disease, cardiovascular challenges, pulmonary diseases, systemic diseases, and cancer, um, stress, anxiety, lack of sleep, lack of working out. Uh, you just go the list and all of a sudden you go, oh my gosh, um, the things that stress us and make us mentally challenged in our lives, um, are causal factors of why we're dying quicker. And, and so, you know, my realization was my initial feeling for 51 years of my life was 
mental health and mental awareness. I've got good, I got it in spades. I'm solid. And what I realized is I didn't deal with trauma of a certain type in my life as in a childhood. <clears throat> and when I went under some insurmountable pressure or cumulative pressure that became insurmountable, I guess, um, my trauma and my mental health suddenly became compromised. I experienced mental illness all of a sudden. Um, I experienced suicidal ideation and contemplation and marking it down on a list of things to do all at, all at once. And for 10 days, I was in the darkest place I, ever be, I was in my life. So um, our traumas, our mental health um, are okay until they're not. And that's one of the biggest messages I'm trying to bring up for men. And number one is we have to talk about this in a normalized way. But number two, we have to understand that if we haven't dealt with it and we just sucked it up or have carried on um, and not shared or not spilled our secrets, if you will, um, it's going to rear up and somehow hurt us. And it might be hurting most men in a lot of ways because of addiction issues, of substance abuse issues, of lifestyle choices, of um, you know really bad leadership or relationship decisions. Uh, all of these things become indica indicative of something that maybe we haven't resolved and we have no control of until we do. I'd like to get Coach Nick's thoughts on this because this is uh, what you said really resonated with me. With We're good until we're not. So we can pretend that things are okay. And maybe, hey, maybe they are, right? On the surface, we're getting the results that we want and we feel good about them. But from what, I, what I'm hearing from you is, uh, you know, it's only a matter of time. And why I want to hear from Coach Nick is because you know, we, we have a quote that we like to share with each other. If you just do nothing in your life, it doesn't stay the same. It gets worse. All right. Like our natural mm -hmm. tendency of, of doing nothing inactivity actually makes our lives worse. Maybe not right away, but over time we, we see it uh, decaying. So it, it, it lends this air of uh, proactively seeking out, you know, in business, it might be the goals that we're achieving. But in this instance, it's actual, the things that are holding us back from being our true authentic selves. Hmm. Yeah, it's, I love what you said, Mike. What really stuck with me was that it, you felt like everything was great and fine. I got it in spades, but it showed up when it's under pressure, right? So I'm thinking, okay, you don't know until you until it's too late. Like the, it's already collapsed under the weight of it. Uh, and so that's like very telling. And then you said, you started to talk about some, some factors you might, see that are indicative of those things and so i think of it like lifting lifting the veil right we can't see ourselves you don't know what you don't know uh, would you talk more about that like what are some yeah. of the things that are perhaps not the obvious that would be that we should be on the lookout for um and maybe they are obvious but just it's you can't see them you can't see the wood for the trees yeah, you know, it's, <clears throat> I spent a great deal of my life um, striving for achievement, uh, pushing harder, um, you know, being productive, if you will, uh, sometimes being more productive than thoughtful, I think, in some, some areas. Um, <laughs> but my, I'm wired to press forward. And, you know, there, there are certain things that we get wired in our brains as kids and as our, through our developmental years that uh, are part of you know, the positive of our growth, right? And I always knew, you know, I knew exactly what my, you know, traumatic event as a child was. And, and it was a an event that was scarring. And, but I always assumed I was fine because I was dealing with the rationalization of what that was. It was childhood sexual abuse at 11 years old. So the pillar of the community abused me and he abused a ton of other boys um, raped boys. Okay. And, and methodically. And what was clear for me is, uh, that that happened and that somehow I was a great student. I was a good athlete. I was driving businesses forward. Um, and so I must have, I must have something within me that allowed me to overcome it. And I attributed that to a great house household, great loving family, and then a great adult family with my wife and our kids. Um, and I attribute my so-called success of overcoming it to that. And it was also because I had no understanding of how that might affect you. And I gave it zero thought. And because no one in the 80s and the 90s and the early 2000s was even talking about um, that just might be connected to some things that you're not seeing. And 
whatever the pressure was for me, it was financial, it was business. It was the isolation of 18 months being in a pandemic. Like all of these things for me were soul sucking and just put me into a place of hopelessness. And then I spiraled into this. Um, so it may have happened at a different time. I couldn't have predetermined. I could never have predicted what that stress, what the stressors were that were going to cause it. But whatever it was, it worked. It got me into this moment. And prior to that, <clears throat> I had noticed a few things in my life that probably got me to those to that point. And I had noticed it. There was, I was like, how come every time I get in partnership or do business with or align myself or work for or with a partner? a man, um, how come every few years that relationship blows up or that person that I aligned with, um, you know, implodes or does something wrong or in, in a couple of cases, you know, looking back, it was criminal, you know, or I don't know, you know, against the rules, let's say. And you look back and you go, my gosh, how did I align myself in that way? And I, and, and I don't understand why I keep, this keeps happening to me. So you asked Josh about what, what are the signs? And one of the biggest signs in life is you go, well, how come this keeps happening? Um, how come I keep going through wives? <laughs> There's a good one. I, I had a great home life, but that wasn't, it wasn't in relationships where my challenges were. It was at the professional side of life. And it was my alignment with people who were flawed. And then when it hit the fan or things were at their all time most greedy, um, I was in this invest investment markets for 20 years. Um, that's when those flawed men, their flaws were amplified and whatever they were, um, I was close enough always or in business dealings with um, that ultimately it, you know, affected me. So I was just as in bed with them, but my, my reason for being there was different. Um, and then subconsciously, now I realize that I was always picking these people because the best man in the room was the scariest man in the room. So the people that everybody thought were great, admired, and wonderful humans, um, those that was the man who abused me. So there's no way in hell I was going to connect with them. And it was con a subconscious. And so our brain has a great way of wiring these things in so that we don't get hurt again. So I can live on and pass on my genetic code and you know, nurture a new life and the next generation, right? Like, like at a biological level, that's kind of what we're there for. And, and so when you consider what was wired in my subconscious, not in our conscious, because if it was in our conscious, we'd screw it up. <laughs> we are aware of it, right? Like if it's a protective mechanism, the last yeah. thing an animal wants is to have to think about it, right? We need to instinctually act. And so one of my instincts was that. And it caused me great challenges because I started to look at myself and I went like, I'm a, I'm a failure. I'm, you know, useless. I am hopeless and I'm worthless. And that sense, those sense of being in that way, you know, was what eventually pushed me into the, into the edge. And so I just, I came out the other side of it because I was desperately never wanting to be there again. And I sought treatment and help. And these things all of a sudden, became so clear, crystal clear through therapy. Hmm. Thank you for sharing all that because that's a, a vulnerable place to be. Um, and I appreciate that. I, I think that pattern identification, as I might call it, is so key, right? It takes, it takes a lot because it's all happening externally in your environment. So it's right. easy to say, well, it's them, it's that person. Like they're, they're the ones, they're the ones. And then at a certain point you and reach that level. with the right? people that it was? It was totally easy because they were really not great. Like they weren't great. They sure. ended up, you know, tricking people, confusing people, being bad business partners, or, you know, they had their own vices. And so whatever their vices did to their lives, I was nearby, you know? And, and so, you know, I'm not just throwing off the blame for the conscious part of that because I'm involved, right? I, I make conscious decisions to be honest. But I realized now I had no choice because there was no way I'd work with the best person in the room. Because somehow I was repelling them, mm -hmm. right? I didn't consciously go up. That's a great man. I don't want to work with him. I always wanted to be in that corner office meeting with the best guy in the room. I always wanted to be in the sideline, sidebar conversation. You know, I always wanted to be in the club, but I always wondered why I was never there. I thought, oh, well, maybe they just smell that the fact that I grew up from a, you know, a lower economic upbringing and maybe that's it. And it wasn't. Mm -hmm. It was more. There was more to it. Mm -hmm. Was there a point, I'm just curious, like how, how did you get to that realization that, hey, I might, I might have a role in what's happening around me? 
So I think that's important to touch upon. Like, how do you identify, hey, th- here, there's patterns happening here. This has happened before in my life. Am I part of this equation? Like, wh- what am I doing to contribute to this? How, how, did, you, how did you discover that? Well, <laughs> it's pretty clear that, you know, contemplation of suicide, ending my life, was the precursor to me coming to that, uh, um, you know, awareness because I went to therapy and said, I need help. I went to a therapist and I said, I need help never, ever going back to that spot. Mm. Now, prior to that, I was quite aware that it would probably, it was probably me in some ways because somehow I was just as much involved in selecting. I just didn't have an understanding of you know, the depth of the decision-making that was going on for me, not by me, right? And it was by me in my brain, but it wasn't me consciously. What I made, uh, you know, what I committed to is I started siding, I started, um, you know, connecting with really good men, but I connected with them as my coaches, as my um, business associates in terms of mentorship. And, but it was always transactional. So what I did is I shifted from these other relationships um, and then I moved into the good men part of my life, but it was always transactional. So I never, ever got what I really wanted, which was more love and acceptance and people to have my back. And the moment I wasn't writing a check every month, they didn't have my back. Right. So again, I was disappointed. So that left me, you know, circling around the drain a little bit because I thought, boy, if I can't get this in those people when I'm then there's something wrong with me. And then the pandemic comes, my business gets destroyed because I was in the speaking and workshop business <laughs> live and in person. Mm. And I really didn't have, you know, exceptional digital skills. And our entire marketplace of coaching, you know, was a, a rush to the bottom, right? Everybody went zero, no cost, you know, $5, you show up and you get the guru's stuff for a weekend. Well, they had half a million followers. So 100,000 followers sign up at five bucks. They're doing okay. Then they went on holidays, but they left all of us in the premium coaching world um, that work with independent owners uh, left to figure out how to connect. And so I felt pretty useless. And that just kind of, you know, as clients dropped off and as the pandemic wore on, people just stopped buying, stopped paying, wouldn't pay. You know, it became a nightmare. Um, so I ended up in this in that moment. And when you consider what other things, so once you go through treatment, I went through something called EMDR, eye movement desensitization and reprocessing. Okay, it's an exceptional uh, a therapy used for um, with bilateral eye stimulation. Really, is all what it is, um, and it is used to reduce the um, PTSD, the effect of trauma. Okay, and so once you've reduced that. And separate out, and my entire book is about that journey, about the journey of removing the emotions that are connected to that negative event that caused trauma, um, and then the healing process and the other side. And what ends up happening is you remove the emotion, and you move, and and then when you remove the emotion that's connected to that traumatic experience, you all of a sudden see all the patterns that were wired into you, and then you can deal with them. And so those are things I never was aware of, but I'm sure. And then you, then what you see is, you know, you go, I've been doing that for 40 years. Well, 30 of my adult years. And I go, boy, that's painful to realize. It's like walking around with, you know, your shirt tucked, pulled out through your fly all day and not realizing that you had that or a piece of toilet paper on your shoe. Like, it, you know, and no one told you and you were doing that for days, right? That's what it felt like. I'm like, I, everyone could see it except for me. And maybe because I was a driving force, maybe because I was pushing for leadership, like all that, maybe that's why people didn't say, hey, maybe you have an issue. Maybe there's something. Or maybe it's because men don't talk. We don't share. We're not willing to encroach on others and suggest that maybe there's something there that we don't know, but it's worth investigating. And because we often don't know what to do next. And so now I'm on this kind of crusade, if you will, to say, men, it, it's connected. Something in your life is connected and it's thwarting you or sabotaging you. And you know it, you know where these issues are. You, you could feel it in your life. If you just take a plain look backwards and you go, okay, well, these things kind of happen all the time, you know, personally or professionally. And then you can go, well, maybe there is something. And then the next step is, 
Well, share it with somebody, share what you think it might be, and then go see a professional. Don't tell the world. Don't, you don't have to get on a pedestal like I do. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm prepared and willing to be in the biggest, brightest spotlight now so that everyone can hear my secret. And before I wanted to be out of that spotlight, hiding the shame, hiding the guilt. But now it has to be out there because men need to have this conversation. So we're just trying to create more moments for men to understand that the conversation's simple. It's way less dangerous uh, than, and risky than you ever perceive it will be. And uh, the only thing that can happen is you can get better by dealing with the <laughs> event that created trauma in your life. And it doesn't have to be so dramatic as sexual abuse or physical abuse. It could be a loved one died. They were extraordinarily careful. It could be neglect that you didn't even notice as neglect. You know, I always think of all kinds of different people, even Bill Burr, he's always on there, you know, now he's ranting, he has his, he's so edgy, but at the same time, you just keep hearing it and he's working through his own stuff and you can hear it in his, you know, in his dialogue because his dad, you know, was a son of a bitch, right? <laughs> and, yeah. and the challenge, of course, is he acknowledges that, but he's just trying to unpack all the things that were wired into him as a result. And it doesn't mean you have to hate that situation you just have to become aware and the moment we were aware we can we can rewire and unwire the old stuff and then it's just so much better awareness space is so powerful maybe this is too detailed of a question mike so uh, re redirect me if you would if you need to but you, you talked about your particular experience and then it could be any type of trauma but is is it also multiple versions of them is it is it there could be a whole stack of these things is it just like what's the biggest thing deal with that and then you're going to find something else and you're going to find something else is it a continuous process of healing does, does it is that a good way to think about it well so what ends up happening is and we, we always we kind of all mislabeled trauma a little bit trauma is okay. the the physiological effect of a negative experience right okay and a negative experience that pushes into us and in, us into that fight or flight moment. Right now we can experience a trauma that is prenatal. In other words, trauma that our, our mom or our parents are feeling while we're in the womb, in our development after about 12 weeks, we've been become cognitive, right? That's when we start learning as human beings in some way. Um, prior to that, we're just putting the pieces together. Right. Um, the, the heart and the lungs and just living as an organism. But then we become cognitive. And the moment that starts to happen, we become affected by the physiological effects of trauma in our parents and especially our mother. There's that. Then there's small T trauma, which is, um, you know, repetitive, ongoing negative experiences through life. It could be that your, you know, your brother or your sister you know, every single day they said you're useless and worthless. You're useless and worthless. And then they pushed you, right? They do that for a decade and that's all they do. They're never otherwise bad. Eventually you're going to feel a trauma effect and you're going to develop patterns to prevent yourself from feeling that way. And then there's the big T, which is the a traumatic event or a series of events that are overwhelming uh, people in war people who have had a dramatic illness um, people who've been abused who experience you know sexual abuse those type of things and then of course they can overlap because there could be duration stuff so those are your three core areas of negative experiences that create a trauma effect and then your brain goes we can't let that happen to that kid again protect that kid don't ever let them in that moment again and that sticks with you and it becomes instinctual and it becomes below the surface stuff. And so when you're an adult, you're walking around with probably like if I was in a, in a, um, in a dangerous, um, primitive moment <laughs> where I would probably respond very well, right? I would probably defend myself and my family in a way that would see me through, um, yeah. instinctually, but we don't live in that. We live in a modern day society where we have social interactions with people that aren't threatening our lives. And from day to day, we're generally in a safe scenario or relatively safe. And so all of a sudden, what you've learned to protect yourself, you know, is no longer congruent with our society. And that's where 
these things challenge. And you see it with leadership all the time. I mean, you see it all kinds of lives, but especially in leaders, like who hasn't had a boss who was a complete, you know, you're like, that guy's such a jerk when this happens, right? But then they're good otherwise, right? There's just a moment that sets them off and then they revert back to this, this pattern. And so, mm -hmm. I know I work, I do a lot of work in coaching and training and doing workshops with leadership teams and executives. And that's one of the key things is everybody's like, okay, my team needs this, this, this workshop, but I'm going to be, I'm fine. And you're right, the person, right. that's the person who probably needs it the most, right? Yeah. You know, the micromanager, um, the person who blows up all the time, like there's, you know, we all know them. Um, we have the examples running in our heads right now as we talk. Yeah, this is really good context, Mike. Thank you so much. You just give me two or three, four other things to hang stuff on him, like in, in the, I guess, tree of my mind of here. If I think about it from a coaching perspective, we're always working on, you know, beliefs as the baseline of, of what we think about, what we act on, what we get and what results we get and then the quality of our life. But if I think about it, at least for how you described it, it works for me to think about trauma being behind beliefs, if you will. So something that might come up, and I love the way you said the three the three core areas of negative trauma or impact. And I love to think about that. Like it might start off with something that's small, which then turns into a belief, which turns into a first level tra trauma, which then can turn into something that's much bigger, that bigger than a belief that becomes something you can't even see and that's infecting not just that specific area, but like a global impact across your whole life. And so... That was really helpful. I don't know. Does that fit in? Does it make sense by that? Just kind of sat well in the in that tree in yeah, my if mind. You th if you think of it this way, that we can learn our way into a successful moments, right? We can learn yeah. um, strategies, techniques. We can position our business, our personal lives. We can become better um, at relationships. We can learn um, the IQ side, the intellectual things. We can also learn our emotional intelligence things. We can learn to be better at judging a crowd or reading the room or being more empathetic. We can learn those skills. And when you think about our impact in life, and I, this is a little equation, IQ plus EQ plus X equals impacts. And X is that, that factor. And so what is the right. variable? Well, the variable is where's your hardwired stuff? Right. So if you can unpack or unwind or unwire that variable and you become aware, then suddenly you can maximize your impact in life and business and personal life, personally, professionally, philanthropically, whatever it is. So that's I that's what we have to differentiate that generally we're about 70 to 90 percent of the way there with stuff we can learn right? Skills. We can learn how to be better, have a better emotional intelligence. We can learn how to, you know, train our IQ, you know, reading, getting more knowledge, getting more experience. But it's that factor that we don't see that lives subconsciously within us until we bring it to the surface, until we become aware, um, then we're always going to have a gap. And just some people don't have gaps in in the place of the the thing that makes them successful so they they seem to keep going along um until of course they don't right? right and that's what we see a lot we see a lot with men who seem to have it all together and um i know that you guys probably also know uh, a man that comes into mind right away when you say well that successful person in the community killed themselves and we don't know why it seemed like they had everything going for them Right. Everybody's got that. The athlete, the, the celebrity, the business leader. But you but then I always scratch my head. I go, I know I know what's going. I know. I think I know. You know, I, I always felt that. And really now it's, you know, painful because you go, you know, you know, there's something. And they just didn't say anything and they didn't deal with it. And they didn't understand that how simple it was to, you know, do the work. You know, it's you break your leg your bones sticking out of your leg and then you spend your life with a bone sticking out of your leg. No, you don't do that. And if you do, you know, you're going to limp, right? And everybody's aware. So you go and tell everybody you should have seen the accident. Um, it was a nightmare. My bone was sticking out of my leg. I went and saw the doctor we, we went and got triage. We got immediate treatment and then we've got a rehab program and now my leg's better. Right. And everybody goes, that's great. Way to go. The same <laughs> stuff happens with our minds. And we're not dealing with it in that way. 
And if, and mm-hmm. so we're forever going to be in a limp because we didn't have the simple steps of dealing with the trauma that we experienced. And it's as simple as that. So why wouldn't we just talk about it and get it treated? Um, it's amazing. You talk to enough therapists, they're all like, we could fix that. <laughs> you know, they scratch their heads. They go, we could probably help you. And fix is a difficult thing because I think there's a duration effect. And for everyone's journey in mental health, mental wellness, um, it takes a little bit longer for some. It's a different journey. It's not the same. We're highly variable. Um, but the process is way simpler than you think. Amazing. Mike, is there is there a, a daily practice? Is there uh, something you would offer people to explore with themselves to kind of open up some first inkling of, a, of awareness? Uh, you might like be curious around okay, what, what can I do? What can I, what can I kind of tap on the door and, and see if, what I can open up to, to play with this and explore a little bit? Well, I, I mean, let's say we're not in a mental, mental health crisis. Right. So, I mean, when you're in crisis, it's an, a five alarm fire, right? You're everybody's, right. you know, things are not going well. Right. And we go, oh my gosh, I got to deal with this. But let's say we're not in crisis yeah. and we've got to do a, a check. We got to go and check up on ourselves. And mm. if you wanted to, if you're saying, you know, I'm feeling sluggish, I haven't been eating the same as I, I want to, uh, you know, I'm, I'm putting on some pounds and I'm just, I'm winded when I go up the stairs and people go, well, maybe there's an exercise prescription for you. Right. And a, and a doctor might say, well, you know, improve your, what you're fueling your body with food wise and maybe start walking every day. That's simple. And then you suddenly start uh, having an effect. So we need to say, well, you know, I know there's these things in my life that may have, you know, have some substance to them. They may be challenging me. And, and every once in a while, I feel like I'm just limited in some way, or, or I'm addicted to something and where no one's admitting it, right? Like there's, you know, there's a big spectrum of people who are addicted that don't admit it. Um, but maybe, maybe if I just went and had one session where I saw a therapist and that person did EMDR, because we want to focus on, was there trauma that created some hardwiring in you? It's not always the solution. But what I think we, we've found and what I found with another fellow I do a lot of work with is, you know, trauma is at the root of so much, right? And, w- and when we do it in a trauma-informed way, we approach it, we go, okay, well, that wasn't so painful. By the way, I just learned that this, I did this all the time. Um, now I can, you know, start taking the steps to change that. And then you go into emotional intelligence work. You go into mindfulness work. You go into all the things that we need to just be healthy, overall, which is move every day, sleep properly every day, nourish your body in a way, fuel it the way you need to fuel it for what you're doing, you know, and, and increase your social interactions. And for men, one of the biggest um, protectors of our mortality is to increase our social interactions with other men. Mm -hmm. Uh, It's amazing how standoffish men are. And then you put them in a room and one person, and this is the effect I get with something I have called Men Worth Meeting, which is a monthly men's group. Um, it's an online group. And all of a sudden you go, this is, this is my story. And I just shared, you know, some very, you know, key details of my life and what I've struggled with. And then the room just lights up. People just start talking and you can't get men to shut up. Every 90 minute session I have goes over, right? We do that twice a month, once as a group and once with a guest speaker. And they all go over and all these guys have way other, other stuff to go with. Like they're leaders, they run businesses, they, they got stuff to do, but they're parked and they're busy talking. And you know, it's not always about what challenges us. So that's like, that's a one thing is men don't realize that we can spend an entire hour and a half talking about a business topic of the day. And you know, just the fact that other men say, well, we're deep with you. We've already gone deep. Let's just rise up and talk about this other stuff. Once you go deep in the conversation and in the um, sharing, um, it's easy to spend time with another man. The, the challenge is we all just talk about the weather and sport and music, like entertainment, and that gets us nowhere and makes us uncomfortable when we hang out. Hmm. That, isn't that funny? Isn't that the irony? Like <laughs> what makes us the most uncomfortable as men is the standoffish behavior in which we socialize. But if we really open up and break in to something deep right away, 
all of a sudden, you know, you love your fellow man, you hug your fellow man, and you share an affinity and a commonality with them. And all of the other BS that we argue about every day or don't agree on just slides away, you know, mm. and respect is in the room and love is in the room. Happiness. It's great. Mike, I'm assuming there's overlap with much of what we talked about today and the Unlimited Worth Project. There's a podcast and we're going to put up a bunch of your links. I, I know that this is going to resonate with so much of our audience here. So we're going to put your links and how to reach you and how to connect um, in the show notes here. But maybe bring us home with uh, a summary of the Unlimited uh, Worth Project. And uh, if you could frame it in what you mentioned earlier resonated with me so much. Like we're only, we're only operating at a certain percentage or certain level unless we deal with these things. So I'm curious to hear where you are now that you, right. There's, there's, there's probably more to go, but you've addressed some of these traumas from the past. You got to be like, and at this level right now that you're like, you're just glowing. Like that spark is out there. Is, is that true? Yeah. Um, I'll um, quickly, I got to a certain point in my therapy midway through, I did two weeks, two hours a day intense. Midway through, I finally had this moment where I was feeling great. And I, I thought, holy cow, I didn't believe that was possible because I just spent the last three months wanting to cry every day. And then I went, okay, I got to find out other men who have been like, who are like me, if you will, in the leadership positions who, you know, did they experience the same thing? And suddenly I started hearing all that, that, yeah, I experienced the same thing. And this happened and all their words and all their experiences and everything started to dovetail. I'm going, oh my gosh. And their stories of trauma were way different. They're all different. But their experience through this healing process wasn't. So that's what my book kind of details is the collection. It was validation by interviews of other men who've gone through the same thing. Um, it wasn't really all their stories so much as it was all their stories validated what I just went through. And so you're right. I, I feel like I'm on a, at a different plane than I've ever been in my life. One thing that's for sure is when you go into a crisis and you go through what I went through for four months, your business goes to zero and you were getting supported by your family and whoever could pitch in and you were not paying your bills for a bit. Like it, it's not, it's not like I didn't lose my house and my car and everything, which is thank goodness. But if you lose all that stuff, it doesn't show up, <laughs> you know? So, um, and when you devote yourself to a bigger cause, um, it has its own way of evolving. And so maybe in the last four or five, six months, things have really started to come together. Um, so if you were to think, well, financial pressures, yeah, that's been the thing that's been dogging me. And it was one of the things that was one of the catalysts too. Um, but now it feels like there's some, some sense of, yeah, there's a path here. And you asked about Unlimited Worth Project. So the goal is simple. Let millions of, get millions of men to start talking and understand that if they do and their families encourage it, um, they'll be better. They can pursue a road of healing, a path to healing, and they can identify that whatever they've lived through in their life and developmental years um, is connected to something that they are limited by today. And that's the biggest. So I lead with that. So how the heck do you do that? How do you reach millions of men? Well, you do what I'm doing right now with you. And that's a guest on a podcast. I host my own podcast. That's my own way. That's this year's version for me of reading. I'm interviewing incredible people all the time. And it's just, you know, no novel could ever share all that wisdom. And then, you know, the podcast, the book, um, I do Men Worth Meeting, which is my monthly global uh, North America wide uh, meeting group. We have people from New York to LA to, you know, British Columbia here, um, all over North America. Um, I have coaching. I do private coaching that now is way more robust than it ever was. I used to coach entrepreneurs on all the skill stuff that you can learn, the how to's. Now we go deep. And once we do that, all of a sudden there are amazing breakthroughs, but it's not easy work. It's, it's work. And then I do workshops and speaking. And, and if I can get on a stage every month, then we can get some leverage and get the word out there all over North America. Um, and, you know, podcasts is like a tree falling in the forest, right? Um, but if you're on a stage and there's a hundred or a thousand people in the room, those people leave with something and, and it just starts spreading. And so that's right now my focus is to get in those stages in those moments, because I think that's where our human interaction, our socialization happens. So lots of stuff going on. Yeah. Um, you know, stay tuned. I have a man, no moss grows on this rolling stone. 
<laughs> well, and lots that we're leaving with today. Um, I'm actually going to take you up. So Coach Nick's question was, you know, what's a regular practice? And you mentioned EMDR. I just came across somebody who does that like full time. So, you know, I was, I was curious about it. I was like, oh, that's interesting. I think I want to hit her back up and maybe do a session with her and just see what happens with that. So I appreciate yeah, that. Yeah. You, you don't have to be in this moment of crisis. You know, one of the colleague that I work with on some, co on some coaching and training for executives, um, he was doing research on trauma informed leadership. And he just went, he said, well, if I'm going to talk about it, I better go do it. And so he did it and he goes, wow, I have this thing. And it wasn't, it's not like, oh my gosh, it's going to open up a can of worms and your life is going to like, it's not that type of an experience. It's wow, that happens. And I'm, and it's, and I'm doing it all the time. And now I don't have an emotional response that triggers me to run from that moment and I can deal with it. And when you have that, all of a sudden, just the calm that comes over you, you stop worrying about. And the other thing, you start putting your stuff out there. Um, you do it like I've done it and you just you don't worry much about anything anymore. I don't have any fears about anything happening bad. Like nothing's, you know, it's only a good opportunity ahead of us. Well, we can certainly feel that from you today. So appreciate you sharing your story. And um, yeah, for anybody watching this and wants to check out more about Mike, check out the show notes here. Uh, gentlemen, any any final words, final thoughts as we wrap up here? Coach Nick, maybe maybe share with Coach Nick. We'll let Mike bring us home here. Yeah, just just thank you very much, Mike. Thank you for uh, adding some more awareness for sure and uh, doing great work out there and touching people. Um, appreciate you sharing and, and the work that you're doing. Thank you. Well, I'm 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 happy and I'm grateful for you too, Josh and Nick, because you give a platform to get the word out there. Every, every time I get this opportunity, I'm grateful. Um, you know, I don't know. I've, once in a while you wonder why anyone want to hear your story, but this is a message worth being out there. The book that's on Amazon that you can buy any day, um, that's out there. Um, we got to get that word out because it's an important thing that will save men's lives and save women. Great challenges <laughs> in life a, a healthy man is a, makes a healthy home amen mike scripnek thank you it's my pleasure thank you guys thank you for watching another episode of truth seekers we appreciate your interaction so please comment like subscribe to youtube apple Podcasts, or spotify wherever you get your podcasts and if you want more check out some of our links Thanks to our masterclass, The Achiever's Mindset, and come join our LinkedIn group. And what do you want to see more of? Remember, we're here to share the simple secrets of successful. So help us do that. What do you want to see? What do you want to see more of? Thanks, and see you again next time.